Rogan was probably got to be the guy where it's like, oh, Rogan's coming to do it. I know, I know he loves Andrew. He likes me. They have, you know, but I was still like, I can't believe we got Rogan in our studio. The first episode, this is so crazy. So it was, yeah, it was, uh, that was the one. And then Izzy, we met, um, like when we were all kind of on the rise, we met Izzy probably 2017, 2018. And so now being like, oh, we, we came on that whole journey together. That's crazy. That like, I'll just text Izzy before a fight and he'll respond or whatever. I'm like, this is wild. everyone and welcome back to a brand new episode of smack talk with sand you know what when i started the show i obviously knew that i had like 90 95 percent guests from the fight game fighters agents coaches you know the score but i wanted to give myself a little bit of leeway just to bring on guests that i am a fan of i'm interested in talking to they perhaps happen to be ufc or mma fans as well and that's exactly who my guest is. He ticks all those boxes. He's uh, an incredible stand-up comic, podcaster, actor. He's just on this incredible wave of success. Uh, I went to one of his shows last year here in Toronto, became an instant fan. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you Akash Singh. Akash, how you doing, Thank man? Thank you, Jamakta. How are you, man? Thank you for having me. Oh man, I'm great. I'm I'm so excited to talk to you because you like I said you are my I guess my first non fight game related guest on the oh, show. Yes. Um here's where I'd like to start with you Akash. You know, yeah. You're killing it. You know, you're riding this incredible wave Thank of you. success especially over the last couple of years. You're just leveling up year on year. Obviously that Thank comes you. from years of grafting, years yeah. of hard work, itching, scratching and clawing. When did you know that this is the line of work that you wanted to get into is becoming a comedian, becoming a comic. When did you know that that was the dream, the passion that you wanted to follow for your life? I knew it was what I wanted to do the first time I ever got on stage. Luckily it went well. If I bombed, I probably wouldn't have done it again, but I knew that was what I wanted to do my freshman year of college. And then I didn't even really start for another like four years because you were Indian. So it was just be a doctor, be a doctor. And this is, I'm old, I'm 39. So this is like 2003 we're talking probably. So the idea of any, Indian, we hadn't heard of us, Peters, none of that existed. So it was just like, what am I going to do? This is a whole different thing. There's no, you know, smartphones or anything. So uh, I think when I graduated, my best friend was going out to LA for a year and then he was trying to be a cinematographer. So I was like, I didn't really do that great. And I was pre-med as a pre-med student. So I had like a year kind of to try to figure it out. And I was like, let me just go see if I can do this for a year and then I immediately knew this is it don't say 39 years old I'm 39 don't make me feel old we're not we're, we're, I mean, young. Is, <laughs> <laughs> we're damn sure not young listen a glass half full as they say um, yeah it's true so so okay so you're 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 got this up you're in pre-med right and, and you just give Correct. up you know that education that's going to probably lead to you know a decent profession post-education yeah. How many years did it take for you to say to yourself, all right, this is going to work, it's working? And can you maybe share some of the, the stories of perhaps maybe times where you thought to yourself, you know what, maybe this isn't working out for me. Maybe this is a stupid, maybe I should just do something regular and make, make sure I, I have a career and a way to support myself long term. Oh, dude, there were so many times, especially early on. So I started for a year and a half in L.A., and then uh, for whatever reason, the, the veteran comics out there at the time would say, you did this backwards. You need to go to New York to get funny. And then you come to LA when you want to get famous. Again, it's all different now because of the internet. But I knew I wanted to be funny more than famous. So I moved to New York. And that was the first year in New York was maybe the worst year of my life. I was just bombing all the time. I was trying to figure out because in LA, I would do like a lot of like cute jokes and then kind of sneak in what I really wanted to say in that little cute thing. And then in New York, I said, let me just say what I want to say and try to make that funny. But I didn't know how much work went into that. So I would ask myself all the time, like, do I want to keep doing this? Is this worth it? I don't know if I'm going to make it. And I really just don't quit. Is I just hate the idea of something else making me quit. So that's probably the only reason I stuck to it. And then again, you don't realize, you kind of think this is always just like an upward climb. You don't, early on, you don't realize there's going to be ups and downs and peaks and valleys. And in 2018, I think 2017, I was on a bunch of MTV shows. 
I made six figures for the first time in my life. Nothing crazy, but like to me, I was like, this is great. I'm just going to keep climbing. And then 2018, I probably made like $4,000 that whole year. We had started the, the flagrant podcast. And so I believe that long term would be a thing, but you're just watching your bank account dwindle every single month. I'm living in New York, it's not a cheap city. At the time, I had a decent apartment because it was, again, I thought I was going to keep climbing. So that was another time where I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. I might go broke. I might have to go home. I think I was down to basically my last month's worth of money. And then we started the flagrant Patreon, and that's when things kind of flipped. That's crazy. What, what, what were the things that kept you motivated during that time? I don't know if I was properly motivated. I've thought this a lot. I've, I had this revelation that like, we all say we're obsessed with what we love. I think I was obsessed, obsessive in thought a lot. Like I would think about comedy all the time and I would kind of like not go through the motions. I worked fairly hard, but not, not really getting after it. But there's a difference between being obsessive in thought and being obsessive in action. And I feel like I wasn't obsessive in actions until the last like three, four years. Yeah. And now I'm like, okay, this is a different grind. If I had done this, I think everything works out the way it's supposed to. But if I had done this, you know, for 15 years, I would probably be much further along. I'd be exhausted and aged, but I'd be further along. Is it nice to look back at those times now? You know, people always say, you know, when you become successful, you look back at the journey and what it took to kind of get you there. Do you look back at it fondly or how do you feel about it now, the journey to get there? Again, there's times where I look back on it really fondly. I'll tell my wife this and it's nothing to do with like being single or whatever. But I, before I met her, again, I was on these MTV shows. It wasn't paying crazy, but like you're getting recognized out on the street. You're performing at all these colleges. There was an independence and like you're kind of you're just now getting a taste of any success. That was like such a fun time in my life. I wasn't even chasing girls, but I'm just like hanging out with my friends. I'm making bills. I'm not working crazy hard. Life is pretty easy. Life is stress free. And uh, there's times like that I'll look back on or there's like, you know, eating at the diner with Andrew after terrible shows. But like we just did that every night. I'll look back on those things fondly. But then I think about like the apartments I've lived in and the living situations and is always, you know, I look at like certain things really fondly and certain things really not fondly within the same time period. You know, when I was growing up in the UK, I didn't see people like me on TV, whether that be right. in sitcoms or shows or, you know, the news broadcast, let alone stand up comics. And then right. Russell, Pe Russell Peters comes along and just kicks the door down, the absolute yeah. goat. Then Aziz Ansari, Hassan Minaj, and yourself. Did you yeah. look to someone like a Russell Peters? to give you motivation and inspiration in terms of what he did for someone that looks like you and me in the comic world. I remember the first time I saw Russell, my first thought, and I was, again, I was in college still. I hadn't even admitted I was going to do stand up, but I was kind of jealous because he was the first Indian to make it. And I wanted to be the first Indian to make it on some weird level, but then he was so funny. And then I do think that was always somebody I could point to and say it is possible. I don't think it, we would have thought it's nearly as possible without like it became a reality once I saw Russell as opposed to this crazy pipe dream. And have you met him on the circuit over the years? I've met a him. He's a him? super generous guy. He's great. I was just texting him this past weekend. He gave my brother free tickets to his comedy show in Dallas. Just like the sweetest, most generous guy. You hear story after story about how nice he is. He's also a, a fight fan himself. He's, uh, he's a poetic fan. on boxing specifically. Yeah. Um, yeah. He'll fuck you up too. Don't, don't mess with yeah, Russell. He's, yeah. he's about that action. 100% his BJJ game is like legit, no no doubt about it. Um, you mentioned Flagrant, obviously, that's where I started to understand who you are a little bit more, you and Andrew, and it was mostly because of the UFC fires that you were kind of mm -hmm. getting on as guests, that right. kind of was the gateway drug to the show and then your stuff and your, you know, you, your yeah. work. Um, and we'll kind of get to that a little bit later on, but what was the, the seed of the gen genesis of Flagrant? And how long did you know Andrew before you guys decided to collaborate on that show? So Andrew is like maybe my first friend that I made in New York City. I moved again in 08. And then we were doing this. Uh, I tell the story a lot. We we're doing this like hood show in Brooklyn. And I remember I didn't know like skinny jeans was the thing at the time. So I saw this white kid wearing skinny jeans. And I'm like, who's this goofy motherfucker? And then we met and the show got canceled. So he gave me a ride home. And on the ride home, we just had all the same taste and all the same comics. And I, we just really vibed. And then I kind of went off and did my own thing. And then I was thinking about leaving New York, but the place where he performed the Village Lantern, I every time I would go by and hang out with him, I would I would get along with everybody there. And I remember thinking, let me give this one more chance. Let me go hang out at that place. I like that place. I'm not really fitting in anywhere else. And 
that was probably like oh nine and then he and i became very close very quickly from like oh nine onward and then as all of his success i've told him this i said this to him yesterday the only time i have ever been jealous of him was whenever he started brilliant idiots because I, he was on guy code, Charles Moran was on guy code. I knew this thing was going to take off like crazy. I knew he had to do it. I had to let my brother do this. But selfishly, I was like, man, I wish I could do a podcast with you. I think it would do really well. And podcasts were just starting to become a thing. But then in 2017, he and I started talking about doing a podcast. We uh, we figured we should talk about sports because I do love sports, but also like sports people aren't as easily triggered politically or whatever we can make with the jokes we want to make. And then we had a uh, good chemistry with another guy named Kaz. So we brought Kaz on. And then that's when Flagrant started. It was 2017. I think September. We're coming up on six years. This might be six years. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how. Uh, maybe you're right. It is six years. When I was looking at the YouTube channel, it kind of only goes yeah. back, I think, four years and change. Okay. Um, okay. So maybe you guys were on a different platform before YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. But when did you know, okay, things are starting to pick up and we're actually starting to generate some serious um you know views and subscribers and it's getting monetized and we're getting you know we're actually making money from doing this yeah covid covid was when i was like as soon as we start i always believed in a patreon also it was easy for me to believe in that because i was going broke and andrew was kind of blowing up but i would be in his ear like dude i think a patreon could do really well for us i think our fans would really would really be about it and we were looking at other big patreons relative to their uh like normal fan base on their public episodes and we were like proportionately i don't think we would make that much money so we kind of put it on ice but i just stayed in his ear i was like no dude i think our fans are like more more rabid and so when we started the patreon pretty quickly i was like oh i can make enough money excuse me from this that i'll be okay and then six seven months after probably no maybe a year and a half after the pandemic started and that's when i really felt like the growth was like starting to really accelerate you know right now i feel like if there's any celebrity that's doing the new york car wash they're going to swing by flagrant and kind of make oh, that so. as a as a part of their kind of uh, media tour if they've got a good pr and comms team behind them but over the years you know outside of you and andrew just doing your thing you've also had some incredible guests on the show is there yeah. one time where you're like i can't believe we got this guy or that girl to come on our show and did it just blow your mind Rogan was probably got to be the guy where it's like, oh, Rogan's coming to do it. I know I know he loves Andrew. He likes me. They have, you know, but I was still like, I can't believe we got Rogan in our studio. The first episode. This is so crazy. So it was, yeah, it was, uh, that was the one. And then Izzy, we met, um, like when we were all kind of on the rise, we met Izzy probably 2017, 2018. And so now being like, oh, we we came on that whole journey together. That's crazy. That like, I'll just text Izzy before a fight and he'll respond or whatever. I'm like, this is wild. Doing this all together. That one's crazy too. It's funny that you mentioned Rogan because that's a great segue to what I was about to ask you next. You know, it's one thing having Rogan on, you know, your show, but then you did Rogan. Yeah. And I kind right. of was re-watching it um, just in preparation to, to talk to you today. And you were like, this is the biggest opportunity of your life in that yes. moment. What was it yes. like to kind of get invited? Did you go to Texas, I'm, I'm imagining, and kind of spend time? So, so I finished my special on Friday, like 5 p.m. We delayed the release. We were editing like probably 60 out of 65 of the past hours, slept in between whenever we could. And then I had shows that weekend. As soon as I pressed upload, I had to perform at shows. I've never been more tired. That was Friday and Saturday. And then Sunday, we had to fly to Austin. I got sick on Friday night, was just crushing NyQuil all day Saturday, did my show Saturday night, flew to Austin on Sunday, and then Monday, I had to do Rogan. And I remember just kind of being like in, you're still in that kind of like war mode where this is, there's, and I, I use the term war very loosely. I know what we do is not dangerous at all, but like you're in that kind of like fight mode where it's, okay, this is it. This is everything this is the biggest obstacle. So I did as much prep as I could on Sunday. And you obviously don't know what Joe's going to ask you, but I want to make sure when I'm talking about my special, if it, if it comes up or X, Y, and Z, if it comes up, I'm not some rambling idiot. So probably the entire night before I was just talking out with my, my camera guy, Kevin, with another comic through Shar Singh and just like, okay, how can we say this clearly, concisely? Let's not fuck around. And then when you do that prep, it's easier to go into Rogan and be a little bit more loose and be like, all right, I know if 
when those things come up, I have that on ice and I got that ready. And then let's have fun in the meantime. Let me just make sure I listen to him and respond thoughtfully. And let's just have fun. You know, obviously coming from the stand up, you know, fraternity, is there a moment that you had with, with Rogue and off air where he perhaps gave you some advice or a conversation that perhaps, you know, you took away with you from that experience? I try not to bother Joe too much. He's the, the sweetest guy. Like I'll, I texted him randomly about that uh russell okung the football player who did the 30-day water fast water only um i texted him about that and he responded i was like hey man what are your thoughts on this so he's the sweetest guy he'll always respond but i try not to ask him questions that are like you already gave me the when you put me on rogan you gave me so much more than i could i had no right to really ask you for advice so i try to not annoy him with that kind of stuff i don't know if he would be annoyed but like you know you've given me enough yeah, that's fair. Um, like I said earlier on, I went to a show here in Toronto. It was like sold out. It was packed. Yeah. You know, no free tickets here. I, I paid for my ticket. I had a great yeah, time with I my could, friends. I would have given you a free ticket. Listen, I'm not about that. Honestly, I'd rather just pay and support anyone that I'm a fan okay. of or interested in watching, right? But like I said, it was a packed show. And then I think it was around the same time you dropped your your first special, Bring Back a Poo. Mm -hmm. Could you just share what it was like putting that first special together and how much of an impact it made in your life in 2022? I mean, so yeah, I, in my, this is like kind of a longer answer, but in my comedy career for a long time, I wasn't getting any real opportunities. Uh, a lot of my peers would be kind of like going out on weekends and doing five shows for an hour each and then flying back. And I didn't understand what an impact that made on their comedy. So I would watch these guys at comedy clubs and I would be in my head like, dude, I don't think I'm, this guy's so far past me as a comic. I don't think I, I don't even know if I can get to that point. And then when I finally started being able to go out and do my own shows five hours at a time, you're just doing stand up practicing. I was probably 15 years into comedy, but you're feeling all this growth happen so rapidly because for 15 years, I just laid a foundation and then I'm doing all of the stage time. So I remember my ticket sales weren't that great before bring back a poo, but my confidence was really skyrocketing. And I had these bits that I wanted to put out and I wanted to put it around this idea of like, this kind of like brown victimhood culture that had popped up and I wanted to attack that. And I was hoping to speak to like-minded South Asian people who were like, yeah, that's, I don't hate the people doing all this kind of like wokish stuff that are brown, but like, shut up. So I, I worked, I think I filmed over like seven shows in three different cities and then we edited and I didn't know nearly how much went into, I had no idea how much went into editing. I knew it was a long process, but I didn't know how painstaking, how many man hours it took, how long every step takes. So again, that we that special took hundreds, thousands of hours to edit. I don't know. We put so many hours into it, making it move as fast as we could, constantly trying to get every tenth of a percentage point better that you can. And then once it dropped and then I did Rogan, you could start to feel a little bit of momentum. And then honestly, I just, uh, again, it comes in waves. I felt like in the past few months, my YouTube numbers have really started to go up. There's been a couple of clips that have like, and I have so much backlog of material that you can say, okay, this guy is actually funny. And then in the past few months I've seen, I feel like there's been another small wave. Yeah, YouTube's a funny thing because back in the day, we were talking about Russell Peters earlier on. It wasn't Russell yeah. that was uploading his his content no. to YouTube. It was people ripping and kind yeah. of secretly filming his his shows, throwing it on onto YouTube, and that's what kind of you know caused this kind of viral marketing campaign, you know, unbeknownst to him, which kind of helped yeah. him blow up in different markets. But this has been pretty much core to what you and Andrew have built with Flagrant yeah. and what you've done yourself. Do you think this would have been possible without social media and without YouTube over the last couple no, of years? No chance. If there's if there was no social media and if I didn't see Andrew do it first, there I don't think I would have made it. Because the climate in entertainment, I think it's probably shifting now, but the climate in entertainment was so safe and so like diversity to the point that it's not even really authentic anymore. Um, and I just never liked that. I, I, I think politically I'm pretty moderate, both extremes. I really am never going to play that game just to get famous. Um, so I just wouldn't have made it. I would have just struggled along forever. I don't know. My life would have turned out very differently. So as much as I am addicted to my cell phone and hate social media, there's no way I'm here without it. Right. You know, I rewatched Bring Back a Poo the other day. I love it, but I especially love the, the, the bit during the, the the end credits where it's a very passionate you know um you know 
promo where it's you just talking about how first generation you know you know south asians or if you come from an immigrant mentality or immigrant family rather you know you don't deserve anything you know because yeah. our parents came over here with like as you call it six bucks in their pocket and they worked their asses off to give us an opportunity to, to give us a chance i was just kind of wondering why it meant so much for you to make sure that was included as a sign off from your first special so uh, I think I was honestly to a degree just looking for something over the credits, but also that was the ethos of Bring Back a Poo. That kind of like, that wasn't, that speech didn't start the whole thing, but that was something I had felt for so long. And then I remember it was an episode of Flagrant where they were talking about something and this kind of like thing was building up in me as, as Kaz and Andrew were talking. And then I just kind of interrupted and it came out in a way that I was very happy with. And I wanted to put that in there because I needed people to understand when you do these kinds of jokes, especially when you say like, you know, I kind of say we have privilege and we're not, there's always a risk, especially with your own people of them being like, oh, you sold out. Oh, if I excuse, if I say white male privilege isn't real, oh, this guy's just, you know, trying to get in with white people or whatever and sell out. And like, dude, I want all my fans, but at the end of the day, I, I want my people, South Asians to really, to really feel like I'm for them. And so I also put that in there to know, so you know, this is why I did this. I'm for you. And I do think this is a message that should get out there. Let's have the other, you know, the other Apu documentary for sure. But then this message should be out there too. I love the message. Um, it kind of spoke to me and I completely agree with what you were saying there. Thank you, man. And, Thank and you. that kind of rolls into recently, um, you just wrapped up your second special. And yes. I'd love to know some insights, some behind the scenes in terms of putting that show together, what it was like for you. Because I believe when I saw your Instagram post the other day, you were kind of talking about how you're still processing it, but it was the greatest yeah. weekend of your life is how you put it. Yeah. Yeah, I've never, this is, so I used to jokingly say this when my wife was, when we were getting married, I'd be like, this is my wife's special. And then when I was putting the special together, my wife kept saying, oh, this is your wedding. Where it's just, I mean, in reality, years of planning and gathering material. But then even when it's, when you think to yourself, okay, now I have to do this special. The beautiful thing about back in the day, the easy thing at least, was if you got a deal with a streamer, they would make the deal before the special was even filmed. They would find the camera people. They would find the location. They would just kind of tell you what it was. You could have input, but we're going to handle this. We're going to hire everyone. You just do your jokes and then it's done. Now, I've paid for the whole thing out of my own pocket, which doesn't sound like it should cost a lot. But then you see all the people that are putting, I guess, their entire weekend into you. And like we had someone that we had someone design a stage because I wanted you know my own background for the special. We had had to have people, multiple people build that out. We had to have, you know, multiple audio guys. We had to have multiple video guys, nine massive cameras we had to set up. I had to find the venue. I had to negotiate the deal with the venue. So you're doing everything A to Z, much like in the way that if you've been married, you see your wife putting together the whole thing A to Z. And on top of that, I just prepared the material as well as I possibly could. I would watch it like game film. I would go do a show and we'd travel to Cleveland, do a show. That night we would come back to the hotel room Kev, my guy, would put it on the TV. Me and the other comics would watch. I would be like, Kev, press pause. And then I would say, is there a funnier word I can use here? Is there a more alliterative word I can use here? Is there a funnier punchline here? Every single thing we just analyzed and I poured every ounce of myself into this. And then when it all came together that weekend, it was like, oh, this is a euphoric feeling. I've never worked so hard for anything in my life. And there's a lot of work left to be done. But this part that we worked for, we knocked it out of the park. There was some very small hiccups, but like, and I'm sure, you know, if I do these jokes again before the special comes out, uh, and I'm coming to London, um, but uh, I could have said this one joke better. I just thought of a funnier way to say that. All that is going to happen. But I knew... I gave 100% of myself to this thing, and I think it came out as an A-grade special, and I'm so excited to, I'm going to start editing today, actually, and that'll take a few months, but I'm so excited for everyone to see it. Now, do you enjoy being that hands-on? Would you prefer if a stream platform just came along and said, here's a check, no. just pop up, you want to be hands-on, you want to have full creative control over every little nitty-gritty detail of the special, right? Yeah, the work sucks, the amount of money I put into it sucks, these are all stressful things, but I remember watching, I'll call them out because, you know, whatever. But uh, I remember watching Bill Burr's second special on Comedy Central. I was a huge Bill Burr fan, still am. Um, I watched this special they put out right when it premiered. And I was like, I mean, it was good. It wasn't as good as his last one, but I guess it was, it was good. 
And then I watched the full special that they put out on like a Friday night at like 1 a.m. or Saturday night at 1 a.m. where it's unedited and you get to see without them chopping it up what it looked like. And I was like, oh, this is so much funnier. This is incredible. And then I realized these guys don't know what they're doing. They're not stand-ups. They might love comedy. No disrespect, but like you haven't been doing it 15, 20 years. You don't know everything that needs to be done. Every inch of this matters. And y'all, you just disregard all those inches. So you lose a lot of yardage on it. I love it. You um, just mentioned that you're going to London. Uh, you got a, yes. a UK tour coming. Have you actually performed in the UK before? Yeah, bombed my ass off in Birmingham in like 2014 or something <laughs> like that. And then Glasgow, I had like an okay set at best, but I definitely just caught a huge L in Birmingham. It was crazy. I'm so happy it's not on my tour right now because I would hate to revisit right. that trauma. <laughs> I feel like where you're at right now, though, because um, I remember when Russell Peters came to the UK for the very first time. And I always love going to those early shows before you start doing the arenas. And yeah. it's like a small theater for with a couple of thousand people. Those are always my favorite shows. And yeah. I just feel like where you're at right now, I just feel like people from London, my ends, they're going to represent, man. I mean, I feel like I so, they're, they're, it's going to be an incredible atmosphere for you. Um, yeah. You, you mostly toured, if I'm not mistaken, in the US and Canada, yes. but now going to the UK, you know, other international markets, are you getting calls to come and do a tour of India and other markets like that as well now? Yeah, India, I did a pop-up show when I was in Bangalore. I was just visiting my wife's family and then we did a pop-up show and it sold out in like 20 minutes. It was crazy. I didn't realize the, the markup was there. Uh, my honest, eesh, this is my honest fear of India is it's like um, the censorship is pretty strong there. So I would love nothing more than to do a show in India. But like if I say something they don't like, even in America, they might cancel the shows. If I go there, that freedom of speech is not real freedom of speech in the sense that like, you know, if you make a joke about uh, another person's religion, that's technically by letter of the law, like, uh, breaking the law according to the Indian constitution, something like that. But I wouldn't necessarily have 100% freedom of speech. Not that you have it here, but it's much closer. So I'm a little worried about doing shows in India for that reason. If I say something they don't like, who knows how it goes. Yeah, no, I totally understand. That's completely fair enough as well. Obviously mentioned earlier on, my gateway drug to both you and Andrew was because you guys had UFC fighters on flagrant. Because yeah. I'm always kind of monitoring, you know, where some of the biggest stars and the champions are making appearances on in media. Um, did you start to see uh, the MMA UFC fan base start to kind of follow you guys a little bit. You guys have had Max, Volk, Aljo, yeah. Izzy. You've had a bunch yeah. of guys on the show at this stage. Yeah, and they're always the best guests. Something about getting the shit kicked out of you consistently makes you so humble, even if you can beat up everybody in a room. Uh, they're just, the, they're fun. They never take themselves too seriously. Uh, they're insightful. I, it's just always so much fun having the UFC guys on. And I do feel like, the UFC community has found, and I am always very quick to say I'm a casual just because I don't want them to judge my opinions. But uh, yeah, it's been really cool to see the UFC community kind of embrace fighting. And it's made me more into UFC. I never watched it before. Now I will watch every Izzy fight, obviously. I'll sure. watch if Volk is fighting. I'll watch if Max is fighting. I try to watch as many as I can, especially when you get to know the guys. Right. I mean, it's great. I'm assuming, you know, when they win, you can just give them a little congrats. But, you know, when someone like Izzy, like you said, you came up with him, you know, comes off a high profile loss. Are you reaching out? Are you having a conversation? Are you give, are you dropping him a text to kind of like get him um, into good spirits or anything like that? Yeah. Okay. Izzy and Andrew speak more. I, uh, I just texted Izzy after this loss. I just said, love you, man. Or love you, my brother or something like that. That was it. I just wanted him to know. He's, I'm sure he knows this, but I just wanted him to know I, I'm sending him love and that's it. I'm not going to, even if I asked you what happened, I wouldn't know what you were telling me. So just let, let people know you love him and that's it. But yeah, I will, I will keep in touch with him always. What is it about having these UFC fighters that differentiates them from guests from different walks of life on, on flagrant? We haven't had a ton of big athletes from other sports, but I do think there's a, uh, like with a, with a lot of other big athletes, actors, whatever, there's kind of a layer in between you and them. Uh, like in terms of uh, how close they let you get, not physically, but like in terms of being vulnerable, being honest, being fun, taking jokes, giving jokes back. With UFC guys, that distance is it's not there. There's no like emotional distance between you guys. You're right here, you're hanging out, you're having fun. And I think that's the difference with the UFC guys. They're just the most approachable. There's, there's no like, like stupid facade up, no guard up. 
than I have. I, you know, most entertainers have that, but with them, it just doesn't really seem to be there. Now you said that obviously, you know, you're starting to watch a lot of these guys when they're fighting on pay-per-views. Is there a group chat with you and Andrew and rest of the crew? Do you guys kind of get together for a, for a UFC uh, event? How does that work? Yeah, we'll try to do fight parties at the studio sometimes. The flagrant group chat is just like always, if there's a big fight, people text about it always. Um, a lot of times one issue is the show, the, the shows are on Saturday night and the fights are on Saturday night. So you end up missing a lot of it. Um, but there's certain ones that it's like, I don't, I have to find a way to, to watch this fight. Izzy's obviously there. I think Volk as well, but like, yeah, it's, it's tough because you're just working on Saturday nights. Yeah, no, I totally understand. Well, this has been so much fun, Akash, honestly. I know you're a busy man. I'm so appreciative that you gave me some time. I know you said that you're a Thank casual. You, so before I let you go, just want to get a couple of thoughts, maybe a prediction for some big fights coming up. Uh, the first one being in New York, we've got the greatest of all time, John Jones, coming up against arguably the greatest heavyweight of all time in Stipe Miocic. I Madison hate to do Square this to Garden. Stipe, because when I was in Cleveland, I texted Stipe, my friend of mine who's a comedian who's open for Matt McCoy. He was like, y'all want to fight Stipe. And I was like, this would be the funniest thing in the world if we got y'all to fight on camera and Stipe just you up so i just dm stipe and then he got back to me like the next day i think we missed each other but like he was so sweet again so nice no whatever but i think it's going to be john i i don't know much but everybody who knows fighting says he's the greatest ever so i think it's going to be john i hate to say that and just prior to that fight, uh, we got a bit of a, an, an interesting, you know, clash of the combat sports world with Tyson Fury and uh, Francis Ngannou in the boxing oh, ring. Yeah. Um, obviously going to be a massive payday for Francis Ngannou. Was that a story that even as a casual that you were following when he was kind of, you know, at odds with the UFC and his departure and becoming a free agent? And how do you think he fares against Tyson Fury? Yeah, Francis also, he was during COVID, so we had to Zoom it, but he did the pod. He was just the nicest guy. Um, People I listen to that know more about fighting than me say Tyson should win, but Francis does have crazy power. And with the four ounce gloves, that might be a bit of a, an issue for Tyson, but he should win. But again, I'm just going off of what I hear people say. Francis has, has a chance. Man, oh gosh, this has been so much fun. Like I said, uh, good luck okay, with your, thank you, man. Good luck with your tour in the UK. Good luck with uh, the editing process on your, on your second special. Um, when you're in Toronto next, let me know. Holler at me. Absolutely. Uh, I want to I wanna reach out and uh, jam with you when you're in, in my ends. Uh, but like I Absolutely. said, you're my first non-fight game related guest and I want to do more of these and I really appreciate you. you coming on, man. Thank you, man. And if your family needs tickets in, in the UK, let me know. I know you don't want free tickets, but I can hook them up. I appreciate that. I might even take Thank you up you on that son. still. Perfect. All right. Nice one, Akash. Have a good one. Yes. Take care. God bless. Thanks for listening to this episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. It really means a lot to me. And hey, listen, if you enjoyed this episode, please go and give it a follow on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows.